He spoke in a calm, clear voice and had a natural expression. The killing was described in his narrative as a surgical session. Welcome to the channel. To date, I will bring you a case that was ranked as the top 10 unsolved cases since the founding of the People's Republic. On the 27th of October 2016, the Criminal Investigation Bureau of China issued an announcement to the nation that the 28-year-old series of rape, murder, and mutilation of women in both Gansu province and the Inner Mongolia was solved. The day before the announcement, 52-year-old suspect Gao Chengyong was arrested in Bai'in city, Gansu province. According to Gao Chengyong's confession, between 1988 and 2002, he committed nine crimes in Bai'in city and two in Baotou, killing 11 people. Some of the victims had their body tissue and genitals cut off. His youngest victim was only eight years old. The crimes he had committed were extremely brutal, and it caused great fear in the city of Bain. Before the case was solved, there were many speculations about the killer. He could be ugly, fierce, withdrawn, and violent. But after Gao Chengyong was arrested, it turned out that he was just one of the ordinaries. The killer, who had been hiding for 28 years, was born in a town with thousands of years good traditions, like etiquette, benevolence, righteousness, filial piety. But he gone against those and was vicious and cruel. He once was a high achiever from a poor family. He actually got the third of a secondary entrance examination. However, his hard work in school didn't bring him the success he wanted, which I meant. He didn't join any universities. He was quiet and rarely smiled, but he was like the others. He grew flowers, raised dogs, and liked to dance and gamble. The irony is that he actually cared deeply for his families while he was taking away lives from other families. Bai'in is a small city in the middle of Gansu province. It had only about 600,000 people back then, and it only reached about 1.8 million today. The city is small in population, though. It was rich with those mining minerals like copper, silver, and others. Our guy Gao Chengyong is from Qingcheng Town which is only 30 kilometers away from the Bai'in city. Born in 1964, he was the youngest child of a family with eight children, five girls and three boys. Many have detected that his childhood wouldn't be too bad as he was the youngest child. You know, the youngest always gets the best. His mother died early and his father was paralyzed for years and Gao Chengyong was always by his father's bedside, which gave an impression to others that he was very gentle, responsible, and soft. In 1984, he took the entrance exam to the university, but he failed. He took the exams twice and failed twice. Although in later speculation, the reason for him not to pass the exam was not because he wasn't smart enough. It was due to some political reason dated far back to his great grandparents. Like in the very beginning of the funding of the People's Republic. In the same year, his twin brother was died in an accident while his brother was working on a boat on the Yellow River. Considering how persistent he was about this whole university thing, and his brother's tragedy. I think he somehow changed around this time because he thought being a peasant was depressed and hopeless. Gao Chengyong actually decided to move out and started to work in the city. He had many jobs, recycling metals, driving taxes, and he had actually been cashiers in some random stores. These jobs wouldn't bring him steady income, so he wouldn't stay on these jobs long either. However, various experience did give him some knowledge. For example, 
he became familiar with the types and utilization of knives. He met his wife Zhang Qingfeng while he was working in Baiyin City. In Zhang's eyes, Gao was honest and reliable. Poor though, he treated her well. Therefore, despite her family's opposition of you know the two, she still insisted to marry him. However, on Gao Chengyong's side, he said later on that his wife was not his type. Quoted, she was a suitable woman for marriage and life. This way of thinking actually continued throughout his entire life. He was able to completely separate his fantasy from the reality. Just as he clearly knew that Zhang wouldn't be his ideal lover, she would be a good wife. Despite her family's opposition, Zhang Qingfeng insisted to marry Gao Chengyong. But to prove that her family was somewhat right, Gao had to borrow from his father-in-law to hold their wedding ceremony. And this was only the beginning of poverty. Gao Chengyong couldn't bring sustainable income to the family when Zhang Xinfeng was pregnant. The family became more and more strapped for cash. So Gao Chengyong took his first step to become an evil. And in this year, he was only 24 years old. Bai Lan, a 23-year-old female worker of the Bai-In company's Liden Zinc factory, she was killed in her home on the 26th of May in 1988. Her brother Bai Ye was the first to discover her death. He went to visit her on a day off. As soon as he opened the door, he realized there was something really bad happened and he quickly discovered his sister's disease. His sister's trousers were stripped off and she was fallen on the edge of the bed. There was blood all over the bed. When he looked closer, he saw a knife slashed across his sister's neck. Zhang Heping, the first police investigator, arrived to the scene, quoted, The ground was full of blood. The smell of blood was particularly strong as we just walked in. A younger cop rushed out to vomit, unquoted. These people were experienced detectives, <sighs> but Zhang Heping said, quoted, I bear the pangs of reversed access to finish the work at the scene. But once those images flashed back after work, I shivered. Uncoated. It's rarely seen in other homicides that the victim's neck was cut so deep that she was almost decapitated. It was noted by the forensics. Her blouse had been pushed above her breasts. Her lower body was naked and she had 26 sharp force injuries. There was a clear blood handprint of the suspect's right index fingers on both the door handle and the inside of the victim's leg. There were also blurry footprints left at the scene. It seemed like the killer had prepared ahead and he could be an acquaintance to the victim. Unlike the others, Bai Lan was beautiful and she often dressed fashionably. And because she often wore white shoes, she gained a nickname as the little white shoes of the factory. So many in the time speculated that the little white shoes was killed because of some love affairs. For this case, Gansu Provincial Police Department sent quite some investigators and police dogs to launch searchings. The police visited the crime scene like many times and they had to work day and night at the bureau to analyze the case. However, all the DNAs and investigating methods weren't sharp at the time, so the police had to use the good old ways to just ask around, see if anyone would have any clues to this very case. The police initially put their focus on people with ex-convicts and past bad records. They extracted fingerprints of detainees 
and compare it to the fingerprints they had collected from the crime scenes manually, but there was no match. Then they had to extend it to all the registered males in Baiyin City at the time. However, all the effort simply gave no result, and the clues actually getting murkier over the time. After the death of Bai Lan, her family was torn apart. Her parents got divorced. Her fiance left Baiyin City, and her younger brother at first was just being really depressed. Then it worsened to a really bad depression, and he actually killed himself not long after his sister's death. Look back to the murderer Gao Chengyong. In 1988, Gao Chengyong's wife gave birth to their older son, but they were still so poor, poor to a point that they couldn't have a full belly on a daily basis. A conducted survey stated that the per capita income in China in 1990s was about 385 yuan, but the per capita expenditures was. 378 yuan. The latter number is catching up to the former, which means that after a year of hard work, people only can just survive. It was getting better when Qingcheng Tang reformed its industrial structure and popularized greenhouse farming. So most citizens, including Gao Chengyong's family, had a little improvement of their incomes, but the cash added to the family from the reformation wasn't much. Or let's just say it's not much to Gao Chengyong. Under such life survival problems, Gao Chengyong didn't bring money home. He actually used it to enjoy himself. He was eating out, drinking, and having fun. Then, of course, he and his wife often have many arguments. Whilst his wife often won the quarrels because she was more outspoken than him, and there was an incident happened around that time that I think is worth to mention. Zhang Xinfeng, his wife, was outgoing and she likes to dance, so she brought her husband along to this newly opened dance hall to have fun. During the occasion, at first it was just someone bumped into Zhang Xinfeng. But then it quickly turned into a physical fight for some reason, and this the other party actually pulled out a knife and stabbed Gao Chengyong twice in his stomach and his thigh. Some speculated that the stabbing might have made him sexual impotence, therefore he became even more sexually twisted later in the crimes. Gao Chengyong was taken to a clinic when he lost serious amount of blood and needed urgent resuscitation. As the victim himself, Gao once told the police that he caught it. I don't want him to pay for it. I just want him to jail. The police suggest him to sue for it.、Mm, I imagine it was a different laws back then. However, a week later, Gao actually just took the money. And let this whole injury thing cool off and disappear quietly. But what was interesting is that he Gao Chengyong he didn't even have the balls to fight back for himself. It's said by the witnesses that he wouldn't move until he collapsed out of blood loss. The only word people gave to describe him was coward. In September 1991. Gao Chengyong's second son was born, which makes things even more difficult. During this time, Qingcheng Tang was suffocating from an economic recession. As resources were depleted, traditional industries were greatly affected. Therefore, all these factory workers and employees were facing layoffs and unemployment. Not to mention someone like the Gao Chengyong who had mastered not many skills. Poverty, suppression, and stress are not an excuse to commit crimes, but they could be a trigger. So three years later, Gao Chengyong struck again.
His second victim was found dead in the staff dormitory of the Bai'in City Electricity Supply Bureau on the 27th of July, 1994. Her name was Shi Xiaoqing. She was a 19-year-old canteen staff in the company. This particular dormitory building was located in the center of the company area, which was guarded by the securities. Most people living in the dormitory building were employees of the company. They knew each other well enough to not lock their doors before bedtime. And most state-owned factories back then had a scheduled shift. Therefore, there were time gaps in between those security guards to the entrances. There were only two entrances to the dormitory building and both were guarded by the securities. So they only focused on the one that was next to the streets. According to Gao Chengyong's confession later, he snuck into the dormitory building when the guards was on shift changing through the less crowded entrance. Xu Xiaojun was found by her roommate. From the crime scene description quoted, Xu Xiaojun was lying on her bed with a thin plate cutting into her neck and 36 sharp force injuries to her upper body and back. Blood was spread all over the wall and the forensic conclusion was that it was a stabbing from the front. The victim only just joined the company for less than a year, but her brother was working in the security department of the same company for quite some time. It's just so heartbroken that he couldn't save her even though he's been working with the security. There was no prominent damages and it wasn't vandalized nor disguised by the criminal, unlike his first victim. So the police couldn't make a connection between the two initially. Police found a puddle of blood left in the communal laundry room and also a blood fingerprint on its door bar. It turned out that the killer actually washed his hands before flood away. The police, of course, were so pissed because they saw it as a blunt showed off. To this specific case, the police initially thought that it could be someone who hated her brother, who was an officer in the security department I mentioned before. So they launched their investigation and focused on people within the company. While the police was looking into people within the electricity bureau, Gao Chengyong returned to his hometown, Qingcheng. He knew that the case would attract a lot of attention and it's gonna be big. So he decided to move to Gaotou with his friend. He became a border worker in Baotou in the year of 1996. To be a boiler worker, Gao Chengyong had to put out with the heat and the fire all day long, but he got to pay daily so he can spend those monies on dancing halls at night. It could be a great time, but Gao Chengyong said later in interrogation that he felt there was something missing, you know, after he had killed two people. On the 26th of March 1997, Gao Chengyong was wandering around in the dormitory building area of China Malertical Corporation number the second in Kundulun district of Baotou city. From his second victim, Gao Chengyong had this vague idea that might be people living in the company dormitories would often leave their doors open when they were home. So to prove he was right or he was just too bored, he snuck into one of those buildings and gave a light push to every door he walk past. Of course, he didn't expect any open room at the time when he did that until he actually pushed open a door. A girl was doing her makeup facing away from the door. When she heard the noise, of course, she looked back. And before she 
saw anything, Gao Changyong already stepped forward and took control of her. He tied her up with a rope he carried with and gagged her. And I don't even know what type of people would bring a rope with them, just casually. She bursted out all of her strength and successfully spit out a cloth in her mouth. She screamed, but right at the time, Gao Changyong flashed a handle of a sweeper right into her throat to stop the crying. Gao Changyong said in later interrogation that his only regression was not bring a knife. He didn't see enough blood that day. You know, she was strangled to death. He then stripped her clothes off and violated the body. In the end, he actually had the time to groom himself a little before sneaking out of the building again. During this whole time, no one had ever seen him. And the police, like in the other two cases, they didn't realize there was a connection between all of them. Well, this victim was died of strangulation which was different from the two before her. And it happened in Balto, which had at least 10 hours drive away from Bain City. That 10 hour driving time was on motorways. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be much worse back in 1990s. So the police in Balto at this time had to treat it as a singular case of robbery and murder. When the police finally realized that the perpetrator could not be someone from the local areas. They started searching on people who recently just moved to Baotou. But Gao Changyong got lucky again. He already moved back to Baiyin. By the time Baotou police was searching, remember I mentioned that Gao Changyong was just moved to Baotou only a couple of months before he committed this crime. From this point onwards, Gao Chengyong realized that he enjoys killing. He can have unparalleled pressure when he was doing this. And he started to wonder how could he extend that pleasing feelings to the extreme. By 1998, Gao Chengyong was even more reckless. He committed four crimes in a quick succession. Two of them were committed three days apart. Often the police was still working on the last case. He already set his target to the next victim. On the 16th of January 1998, Yang, a 29-year-old woman, was found dead in her home in the Victoria Street by in district by in city. She had been cut open at her neck, coated, naked, with a total of 16 repeated step wounds to her upper body and a total of 13 by 24 centimeter skin and flesh missing from both ears and the top of her head. No body fluids were left behind and there were only two incomplete blood footprints. Just three days later, on the 19th of January 1998, the victim coated. Blouse was pushed up to her breasts. Her trousers were pulled down to her knees. Her neck was stabbed and cut. There was eight stab wounds to her upper body, and 30 by 24 centimeter of flesh was missing from her left nipple and back. The distance between the third and fourth victim's homes were only two kilometers and they both live very nearly to the Bain Police Department. On the 30th of July 1998, an eight-year-old girl was murdered in her home by an electricity supply bureau's metering station. And this specific location was only 50 meters away from Shi Xiaojing's dormitory, the second victim of him. And it's only been four years since Shi Xiaojing's case. Shouldn't they just improve a little to their securities in those dormitory buildings? Gao Chengyong at this point had changed his plans and targets to fulfill his need to get psychological satisfaction. He now selected single women as his prey and set his eyes to those living alone in the company dormitories. As he already proved himself, people living in dormitories often have their doors open during the daytime and most people are on work during daytime. So when he ever 
never had committed anything. No one would have seen him. In later stage, instead of giving casual pushes, he would purposely knock on the doors to the victims he had chosen. Back to this somewhat unique case, the girl's parents couldn't find her when they got back from work. Of course, they've been looking and searching until they finally reported to the police. Desperately, they, along with the police, discovered that their baby girl was lying in the bottom of the catboard all this time when they were looking for her. The girl's clothes were gone and there weren't lab wounds on her body, but her pubic area was torn and she was strangled by a belt that was still on her neck when they discovered her. And after what he had done to the girl, Gao Chengyong actually made himself a tea. Apparently, he wouldn't bring tea leaves to the crime scene, so he had to dig through the house, unable to somehow pour himself some boiled water to make a cup of tea for himself. The glass he had used to drink the tea with was poured on the table at the crime scene and of course his fingerprints were all over the glass. Gao Chengyong was shredding crocodile's tears in an interrogation later. He said he couldn't look into her eyes because his older son was only 10 years old at the time when he killed and assaulted that girl. <sighs> he said, quoted, in the end I felt bad for the kid so I kissed her and carried her into the cardboard. <laughs> so, what, so, so what were you thinking when you molested her and killed her? Huh? <sighs> but if what he had said was real, it seems that at that stage he was full on crazy. He was bloodthirsty to a point that he was in fear of being caught. To the family of the victims. That day of what had happened, the girl's mother actually took her to work in the morning, but for some reason she had to left her home alone in the afternoon. You know, it's just a couple of hours before she got back from work. So at this moment, when she was standing outside of her home, looking at the door lock, she once was thinking about locking it from the outside so her daughter wouldn't be able to open it from inside. But in a worry of emergency, she didn't do it. And that led to her daughter actually open the door for the perpetrator. She, the mother, must be so guilty and regretted for the rest of her life. Since murder cases kept happening, people living in dormitories either had to move out or lock their doors firmly and worry about safety when they were home. The police pigeonholed the suspects within the company again, like in previous cases. A police officer still had this two huge block of documents that written in details about everyone's hobbies, relationships, whereabouts in different times and so on. But the people written in the book either have alibis or just not a match to the killer profiles. The killer's mode of operandi became more violent he was calmer and more prepared. He left plenty of time before and after his crime. According to the police report, the murderer sneaked into the victim's home and they discovered that, coated, the victim's neck was cut open. There were 22 stab wounds on her upper body. Her lower body was naked and her breasts hands, pubic area, and ears were cut off. However, there were no body fluids left behind, and this time the killer took away cash and photographs of the victim with him. When the investigator Wang Yang arrived to the scene, and he came across the stretcher that was carrying the disease, an arm hung outside of the stretcher. You know, out of kindness, he wanted to put it back for the victim. But when he reached, he felt instantly that there was something thing strange until he actually looked, realized that the palm of the victim was missing, and he was shocked before feeling frightened. 
Gotten Yun said in a later interrogation that he threw away all those body tissues he brought with him into the Yellow River and returned to his hometown, Qingcheng, right after. On the winter solstice of 1998, which was the 22nd of December, Yu, the neighbor of the last victim, Cui, had a head-to-head -head encounter with the killer in a public toilet. Early that morning, Yu was using the female's room in the public toilet, but suddenly she heard this noise, you know, a man walking towards her from the man's toilet. She was confused and scared because it's just her in that toilet alone in that very early morning. When the man showed up to the female room, she looked up and described him as a 5 foot 8 man with dark hair, worn a mask and a jacket. And the jacket he won had some letter printed on the back. He walked straight to Yu and crouched down to the next room to her. You know, they only got a really low and thin wall separate the two. She can hear her own heartbeat when she saw the this man crouching down and hearing this tiny noise made by the keychain he carries with him. And because the wall between them was so low, as I mentioned, they could actually have a eye contact to each other for a like full minute. Ryu saw that he had this bowl of toilet paper in his hand. She knew right away that he was about to gag her with it. The man suddenly stood up and she reacted quickly, busting her trousers and ready to run. But he was a lot quicker than her. She saw him put up white gloves and took out a knife with a rated blade and put against her. Don't be nervous and don't be afraid. That were the only sentences that man ever said to her. And she heard a local accent. Fuck, she thought, how could I not be nervous? You are killing me with a knife. Ryu desperately grabbed the hand that the perpetrator was holding a knife with and pushed him back with all her strength. Luckily, she was doing quite a lot of fun works before that happened, so she was really strong and fit at the time. She then rushed out of the toilet and head straight to her home. The man was still trying to follow her, telling her until he heard the barks from the neighbor's dogs. Yu stumbled but arrived to her home safely, crying to the ground. After she explained to her husband what had happened to her, of course, her husband was so angry, he chased back to the very public toilet of what had happened to his wife. But of course, the perpetrator was long gone by then. Well, he didn't find the perpetrator, he found a phone booth and reported it to the police. Hearing what had happened to Yu, the police realized that it's gonna be him. And this case could be conjoined with one another that we have just told. So the police reached out to Yu, wanted her to help and cooperate them to catch this perpetrator and to further protect Yu's ID. The police actually instructed her to cut her hair short. Then three police officers joined her into the citywide search of the killer. But this time Yu couldn't be lucky again. She and police couldn't find him anywhere. Of course, he got back to his hometown again, hiding in his old Qingcheng house. Although the police kept their mouth shut all this time when these cases were unsolved, rumors somehow spread across the city. Quoted, there was this killer in Baiyin city who preferred young women dressed in red, worn long hair and high heels. And other rumors speculated that the killer prefer women dressed in red because of some previous failed love affairs whatsoever. None of those were true, but they did cause a great fear among the citizens. You know, people wouldn't wear red out. The panic affected schools. More than 10 years went by. The early dismissal of evening classes, they continue to nowadays. During that time, there was a sharp increase of reports to the police that many often felt being stalked. Both the citizens and the police became so skittish to a point that they described themselves as on the edge of being crazy. 
because this serial case wasn't having enough progress. The Gansu Provincial Police Department decided to send supervisors and brought in experts from all around China to assist the investigation. At first, the police targeted males with ex convictions and bad records, born between 1958 and 1975. They summarized seven possible personalities this guy could have been possessed, including sexual deviance, isolation, solitude and physical agility and cold-minded. They also found that the criminal had a habit of watching in the nearby public toilet before he go into strike and the female victims were all good looking. After the year of 1998, Bayan police started a large-scale map collection of DNAs and fingerprints of the Bayin residents in a region where from downtown Bayin to Wuchan, 25 kilometers north of the city. However, due to the limit of technology back then, DNAs wasn't identifiable as now it is. And taking fingerprints was also far from easy. The comparison of fingerprints were done manually. The detectives were literally had to hold up this magnifier and check the differences between all these fingerprints. In those days, the public was frequently questioning the police and blaming them of incompetence. At that time, the city was intense. There were patch lanes 24 hours a day and natural curfews cause people didn't want to go out anymore at night. It was not all the male residents got their fingerprints collected, but also contract worker came to work in the city. The passengers coming and going from bus stations, train stations, they all have their fingerprints collected just to compare with the killers. Even so, the killer was like a ghost. Three consecutive years since 2000, he was still roaming the city of Bain, entering random homes in the streets and alleys, and committed series of horrific murders. It was on the 20th of November 2000. A 29 year old woman, Luo, was killed in her dormitory of the cotton mill factory. But her two year old boy was left alive. Some speculation is that he was left alive because he was, you know, a toddler. This little kid wouldn't ID the killer. But I think it might not be the case because the killing of a little kid wouldn't bring him this thrill. He was longing for. That's why I think that he was left alive. Similar to previous murders, the victim's neck was cut open. Her hands were cut off and he took them away. During the Chinese New Year's in 2001, a female worker was returning home from a night shift and she was followed. When she opened the door, the man right behind her was also trying to squeezed himself in. However, as the series of cases was notorious at the time, she was prepared. This lady had discovered that it must be him. So when she realized that she was followed, she only opened a tiny gap of the door. Then she squeezed herself in, then quickly turned around and gave a deft yet strong push to that man. So he, you know, got pushed over. She quickly shut the door right in front of that man's face. A lot happened in an instance, but before she realized, there was that man staring at her right through the windows. It's just like a horror movie. And because she was home alone, she had to quickly phone her husband. She dialed her husband and next him home and of course her husband rushed home quickly. The couple actually saw that perpetrator was reappearing outside of their windows again. Both of them felt panicked and nauseous. They phoned the police and reported there was you know a strange man outside of their home. But by the time police arrived, predictably the man was gone. Again, when the police noted down what had happened, they realized that it was him. So they deployed a large number of police officers to start a jackknot search. Yet the perpetrator was like a ghost. He disappeared.
On the 22nd of May 2001, the police emergency center picked up a phone call from the victim Zhang, but she lost the ability to talk. Despite she tried so hard, she couldn't give a full sentence to the police. They described that she was injured and she was home. The police on the other side of the landline could only hear this blurred, pearled noise, so they ignored that call, or let's just say, didn't think that it was important. The authorities he was notified when Zhang's family brought up the ambulance, but the doctors arrived to a crime scene. She tragically had her throat slit 16 step wounds to the neck, and she was raped. Shui Chuan Road, her home, was only a street away of a police station, though they just couldn't save her. However, this very tough girl actually left two really important pieces of information about this killer. Long hair and local. The police later analyzed that if they had reacted when they received that blurry, noisy phone call, they could have saved her. And they could have also collided with the murderer, as there was only one exit from the crime scene. But they missed it. It's harder to get him again. In December 2001, Gao Songyu attended a teacher-parent conference at his son's school as a mandatory, at which the teacher repeatedly stressed the safety that all students had to pay extra care on their well-being when there was a murderer on loose. While Gao Chengyu, that guy they was talking about, was in the audience, according to his older son's recollection, this was once and only conference that his father was ever attended. On the 9th of February 2002, another case took place. Zhu, a client of a long-rented private room of the Taole Chun Hotel in the Bayan district, was murdered. The victim was raped and her neck was cut open. Her blouse pushed up and her lower body was naked. Shockingly, the crime scene was only 50 meters away from a police station right across the street. Again, Gao Chengyong had confessed in the later interrogations, saying that, quoted, I just thought I've left quite a long gap between each cues, and if I don't take that long of a break this time. The police shouldn't be able to react in time. Zhang Xin, an invited investigation expert from the National Ministry of Public Security, his specialty was at mock-ups. He drew three mock-ups of the suspect based on the memories of the witnesses from 2001. You remember? That female worker and her husband. But it's been a year, memories got blurry. The final portrait of the mockups only a little bit similar to the suspect as we already knew here. Nonetheless, for the buy-in police, these three mockups were the only direct clues they've got of the suspect. Over the next few years, the police conducted a screening exercise of hundreds and thousands of men in buy-in, which has a caseload that was extremely rare in Chinese history of criminal investigation. After this, the killer suddenly stopped the killing and disappeared completely with nine killings in Bai'in city. Some committed rape, some not. Some showing signs of financial misappropriation, some not. The killer does not seem to have a single purpose, but he left people with tons of fears and remorse. Coated. He knows how to analyze the conditions. There are circumstances that weren't given enough room or time to rape, so he acted differently according to the situations. I bet he's a dual personality, dual purposed, need the money in his life, and he was perverted psychologically. He needed to do this and left no one alive, said Bai Hao Yuxin. He joined the buy-in investigating team back in 
the early 1990s, he concluded quoted, the killer knew human autonomy pretty well, so he found the main blood veins accurately. He strikes to kill, and the investigator Hao Yuxin had rehearsed in his mind many times how the killer would have appeared and leave the scene. According to comprehensive testimony, forensic evidence, detection, and other the aspects, it seems that coated. Sometimes he stalked and broke into the house. Sometimes he pushed doors to seek opportunities. He would wear dark clothes, therefore the stain of blood wouldn't be obvious on it. Forensic evidence also proved he would bring it back to the crime, which probably was loaded with knives and a set of clothes to change. Hao Yuxin's intuition told him that he could be a good guy among the crimes. Coping with being a dutiful son, a virtuous husband, in order to cover up his true face. In summary, he was dual personality and he had a sexual perversion. Sewing the case was extremely difficult. Back in the 90s, there was almost no CCTVs was set on the streets in the west of China. And despite blood, fingerprints, footprints, and other physical traits were all left behind at the crime scene. The police were never able to get him. One of the police officers in the investigation team admitted feeling guilty and shameful as it was almost no progression at all at that time. During Gao Chengyong's absence in 2002, his older son came first in the town's exam. I guess that somehow touched him. Gao Chengyong could have thought that their family would eventually grow out of poverty and unluckiness since his son seemed to have a bright future by attending universities. So he stayed quiet. He didn't strike again since then. In 2004, the Bayan police finally released to the public about this serial case in the hope of getting useful information. They also offered a 200,000 yuan reward of the suspect. Portraits of the suspects were pasted all over in the meantime, the local TV station broadcast a circular message calling for clues on the 5th of August 2004. Finally, nine crimes in Bain were combined with that two happened in Balto City. See from the timeline I sorted, the other case in Balto was missing because it was never disclosed by the police, but it was said to be committed in between the 1988 and 2002. After the 11 cases were conjoined, experts in criminal investigation were called around from all over China again to discuss and analyze the case. In those days, younger police that had worked on this serial case was, you know, confident fingerprints DNA left all over. You know, how could it be difficult to catch him? Just needed to be done by the comparison of all. Then you will find them easy, right? But after many, many years and lots of work had done, they just couldn't find him. He was never in any record of their database. The time passed too quickly to the year of 2011. An open letter from a police officer that once was worked in this serial case was circulated on the internet, quoted, I never caught you and I am a lifelong sinner to the relatives of the victims and also the later generations of people. But look at the killer. From 2006 to the March of 2012, Gao Chengyong and his wife rented a flat in Baiyin City. The flat is actually only 400 meters away from the home of his victim, Law's residence. Around 2013, around 2013, Gao's wife ran a kiosk at the technical school. Baiyin Industrial School. 
after the Spring Festival in 2015. Gao Chengyong's village had a land payout by the government. After getting the payment, Gao Chengyong started to work for his wife at the kiosk. The school students were particularly shocked and confused after Gao Chengyong was caught. According to them, quoted, Gao Chengyong gave the impression of being gentle, friendly, slow to speak, and generous. He often gave us discounts. It was unimaginable of what he had done. So how did they catch him after so many years of quiet? A man had a surname also was Gao. He was arrested because of paying bribes, which led to the police take a sample of blood out of him, you know, to put into the criminal DNA database. After all those complicated tests, and stimulation carried out. The genetic data of this guy actually matched to the suspect of that serial case. It turned out that the bright guys had a distant nephew could be the one. Then they of course launched comparisons of DNA fingerprints between his remote nephew and the suspects from the case. And all these were matched. Gao Chengyong, his remote nephew, was the murderer of that 11 killing case. Because of this incredible luck, Gao Chengyong, who has been hiding for 28 years, is now exposed. On the 26th of August, 2016, the campus of this school was evacuated in the name of renovation and the kiosk Gao Chengyong had worked in was painted in coke red. That day of action, Gao Chengyong, 52 years old at the time, was working like his every other normal days in the kiosk. A staff member at school later revealed that he was actually identified as a suspect a few days before the action. Police had asked a few students to go shopping and double check the recollected fingerprints. When he was facing the police, Gao Chengyong was a little panic but he gave out his wrists willingly to let a police handcuff him and escort him into the police car. The police asked, quoted, Do you know why you were arrested? He answered, quoted, I knew for murder. The night he was arrested, Gao Cheng Yu attempted suicide, hitting his head hard on the bump of the interrogation chair. He didn't kill himself though he received three stitches. He was then quickly calmed down and confessed in details of all his crimes. Surprisingly, he remembered everything to the exact date, an hour, if not minutes, of every murder he had done. The reason why he had stopped in 2002, he explained that one was because he was getting older and gradually drained out of these desires. Secondly, his two sons needed money to continue their studies. Therefore, he had to work in other cities in Inner Mongolia as a construction worker to support the family. And that heavy field work as a construction worker exhausted him. The police actually asked him if he were ever felt guilt or apologies to the victims and the family. He was just emotionless and shook his head. The only emotion he had ever shown in his face was when he was asking about his two sons. My children wouldn't be affected by what I have done. Would they? According to one informant, quoted, he spoke in a calm, clear voice and had a natural expression. The killing was described in his narrative as a surgical session. It's emotionless. This day had probably been rehearsed many times by him. He remembers exactly when, where, and how he committed the crimes and reminds us that if we share it to the public, we should cut out the detailed parts that could be imitated by others. And he said his greatest fear was of sniffer dogs rather than people when he was in hiding. In the evening of the 27th of August 2016, the city was awakened by the intense sound of firecrackers. The family of victims who had been mentally tortured finally found closures. They just read that of firecrackers to celebrate his imprisonment. At 10 a.m., 
on the 30th of March 2016, Gao Chengyong was sentenced to death by the Bai'in Intermediate People's Court. The court then disclosed the specific sentences through their official WeChat as follows. Gao Chengyong was sentenced to death for homicide, to death for robbery, and to 10 years imprisonment and 3 years imprisonment for rape and insulting corpses, respectively. When he was asked about his first victim, Gao Chengyong was trying to lie about motivation. He said it was just a robbery gone wrong. Therefore, it ended up he killed her in the end. But that's not the case. It is possible that Gao Chengyong committed that crime in 1988 when his wife was pregnant and he had been sexually suppressed for quite some time. Therefore, his primary motivation was to rape rather than robbery, as he said. It's just that it somehow got wrong. He started to kill when that poor victim fought back for herself. There was a period of time between his first and second crime. No one was ever suspicious about him. He gradually believed that no one would ever catch him and he dreamed about his first victim like multiple times until he completely sexually perverted you know he wanted to revise these feelings from killing again continued his path of being an evil some people commented online saying that if he Gao Chengyong ever got into university things might be different but I don't see it that way as those abound with difficult life experiences wouldn't all become evils most people work hard to get out of difficulties rather than killing innocent people well thanks for watching we'll see you in the next case